Hello everyone and welcome to a fresh episode of Ask the Pediatrician's Hour on whichever platform you're watching from. Uh, for those of you watching on Fresh Waves Radio, uh, Facebook page or Ask the Pediatrician's Facebook page, I want to bid you a warm welcome. Warm welcome to those listening on the podcast of Fresh Waves Radio and those who are watching on YouTube, ACP TV. Welcome to a fresh episode of Ask the Pediatricians and I hope you've been learning a lot on our program. Remember that you can always listen or watch past episodes on any of these platforms. Ask the Pediatricians Hour is brought to you by Ask the Pediatricians Foundation which is a non-profit organization in Nigeria that is committed to reducing preventable deaths of children. And we do that through health education and information online uh, through our various social media platforms, including our award-winning Ask the Pediatrician's Facebook group. We also do free community medical outreaches to indigenous communities uh, where children will not easily have access to healthcare professionals. And I'm happy to inform you that our May, June 2022 National Children's Day outreaches have started. Uh, we did one in Delta last Saturday. And this Saturday, we are going to about another 10 states throughout Nigeria simultaneously to have our community medical outreaches. Of course, we will appreciate your support for our community outreaches. You can volunteer and you can also uh, donate financially all the details are there on your screen we thank you so much for being our partner in uh, promoting the health and welfare of our children so welcome to a fresh episode and today again we're going to be talking about another important topic that has to do with the health of our children uh, i've been addressing particularly topics that have to do with uh, the common causes of deaths of children in Nigeria and Sub-Saharan Africa. And last week I talked about neonatal jaundice and I'm still going to stay with the newborns and neonates uh, as we call them for a few more weeks as I'll be addressing some important topics that affect newborn children. And this is important because a cutter that is a 25 percent of all deaths of children uh, below the age of five actually happen in the first month of life i mean that first month of life is the most crucial month of life for any child when we are talking about survival because majority of the deaths of children actually happen in the first month of life again majority of these deaths in the first month of life actually happen in the first week of life. So 75% of all deaths of newborn babies will actually happen in the first week of life. And then again, 75% of all the deaths will happen in the first day of life. So that first day of life is the most crucial, crucial day of any human life. And I can understand why people from the southwestern Nigeria culture will tell you, like a queer woman, in other words, for you to have a baby who is alive, you have actually escaped so much danger. Because obviously they've studied and realized that a lot of children actually die in the first one uh week of life um, and especially in the very first day of life and one of those conditions that can lead to this death is what i'm going to be talking about today which is commonly known as birth asphyxia birth asphyxia we tend to also call it perinatal asphyxia because some of the issues that are related are not just during the delivery of birthing period some of them actually start shortly before the baby is born and some even happen afterwards. But today we're going to be talking about birth asphyxia, which is the number one 
the commonest reason sometimes for babies dying in the first day of life. So when we talk about asphyxia, what we, what do we mean? We are talking about the fact that a baby that was born that was not able to cry or did not breathe uh, after birth. So uh, I'm trying to give it to us in a simple and easy to understand language. Okay, so when a baby did not cry, and, and as a result of that, oxygen did not get to the brain, during or shortly after birth, we're talking about a child who has suffered bat asphyxia or perinatal asphyxia. And why is this so important? Uh, when the baby is in the womb, all that the baby needs, the oxygen and all the other nutrients, they are passed to the baby from the mother. Okay, so the, that is why we have what we call the placenta uh, and the umbilical cord, you know. So the, the placenta passes, you know, takes everything the baby needs, passes it, takes it from the mother and passes it to the baby, including the oxygen that the baby needs. And then takes away all the waste products that the baby has made, passes to the mother and the mother excretes So it's so important. And now when the baby is being born, what we normally do is to cut that like a cord. Of course, the baby already has his or her whole lungs fully made, fully functional, but they are not yet working because they are full, they are filled with water. So the process, the lungs is the part of our body that brings in oxygen to us and then takes out the carbon dioxide. So it is so important because every organ in the body needs what we call oxygen for all the work to be done. So that process for a baby in the womb, it is the oxygen is coming from the placenta to the baby and from the mother. Uh, but the lungs is there but the lungs is full of water it's not working so when the baby is born and the umbilical cord is caught and that means that that oxygen supply to the baby has been cut off it is so important for the baby to now start uh, using his or whole lungs to get oxygen from the atmosphere and to breathe okay so that is what normally happens. So that process, immediately a baby is born, most babies will do that by themselves. So they start crying, and that is why babies cry. In that process of crying, they fill their lungs with ox with hair, and all the water in the lungs kind of get pushed out of the lungs so that the oxygen flows into the lungs um, and circulates around the blood. And that process is, is always easy for most babies. 90% of babies will do that. But some babies struggle with that process. And when they are born, they did not cry. And so when they did not cry, we see that oxygen will not get to the baby and to the brain. And that is why you see doctors, nurses, always trying to get the baby to breathe or to cry and because if oxygen does not get to the brain of the baby within the first five minutes after five minutes the brain actually begins to die and the brain is one of those organs in the body that is not fully formed at birth okay and then when the part of a brain dies that is the head it does not regenerate it does not grow back again so sometimes when you have a cut on your body your skin another skin will be formed to replace what has been lost but that does not happen to the brain so if anything happens the right so when the oxygen is not getting to the uh if the baby did not cry oxygen is not going into the blood the body tries to protect the brain and the you know and the vital organs like the brain, the heart, the kidneys, and ensure that those ones get the, the blood and the oxygen that is available, hoping that things will go back to normal soon. But if that does not happen, then what happens is that those organs will start to shut down. Okay, the brain starts to die, the heart may have problems. And if nothing happens again and that process is not reversed, then the baby will actually die. And, but if we don't, if the process is reversed, maybe may not die. But if 
it took us a long time before we we get oxygen going into the baby going into the into the brain then some part of the brain may have suffered uh, permanent injuries and such babies may end up having lifelong uh, disability disability like um cerebral palsy intellectual disability seizure disorder convulsions and all that all because oxygen did not get to the brain as soon as quickly as the baby has been born and it took us a long time so that is why it's so important that we talk about birth asphyxia because this is one of the commonest reasons why newborn babies die it's also one of the causes of these uh, disabilities that I've just mentioned uh, because the brain suffered injuries. And like I said earlier, once the brain suffered injuries, um, uh, it cannot be reversed, okay? The brain is just such a sensitive organ. So now the question is, why do some babies not cry? What are the reasons? What are the causes of battle space? Why, or what are the risk factors that will make some babies not to cry as fast? Because like I said, majority of babies will actually cry and they don't need us to do anything and that's why some babies are born at home or born on the road or born on the way and they're fine but sometimes you and you know we will have some babies who need help to breathe within the first minutes of life that minute we call it the golden minute it is so important that babies start to breathe within that first minute because the longer we wait before the baby starts to breathe before oxygen starts to get to the brain the more likely that baby is going to suffer uh, brain injury, how the baby is going to end up having um, uh, complications in future. So what are those risk factors that could make a baby not to get oxygen or blood to the brain? And this process sometimes can start to happen, like I said, we, we call it perinatal asphyxia because it can start to happen before the baby is actually born. So in fact, the reason why some babies are born not crying is because they're already stressed or they already suffer some injuries when the baby is during that process of labor or even during pregnancy. So it is a perinatal asphyxia. It is not just only after the baby has been born. So there are factors that may affect, that may be due to the mother. There are factors that may be due to the baby. For example, like I told us earlier, the mother is the main source of supply of oxygen to the baby in the womb. So if anything happens to the mother that leads to either a blood pressure dropping or that affects the placenta or that does not allow that blood flow between the mother and the baby, then that can lead to that baby not getting enough oxygen, you know, during, uh, during pregnancy and even during delivery. And what are these risk factors that could make a mother to struggle to give her baby enough oxygen? So usually we notice that it's common in mothers who are young, too young or too old. So mothers are the extremes of what we call the reproductive age. Uh, the, the, um, we, we, we used to say the optimum period for a, for a woman to have a baby. So if a mother is too young, less than 16, or she's too old, above 35, those mothers are at risk. I'm not saying that all those mothers are going to have babies who will not cry, but they, are, they have higher risk of having a baby that will be born that may not cry okay so mother less than 16 mothers over 40. also we found that it is commoner in in babies mothers of no social economic status i guess that affects so many things because the social economic status may affect the mother's uh, nutrition may affect her health well-being and all that so it's the it's no social economic factor is a risk for a baby having better fixer mothers who have other illness so mothers who are diabetic mother who are hypertensive mother who have cardiac problems mother who have uh hemoglobin excess um uh, mother who have, have renal disease chronic renal disease and all that also mother has other health issues in you know before the pregnancy or during the pregnancy it increases our risk of having a baby that may not cry or that may have what we call birth asphyxia okay another risk factors is mother who had bad 
experiences with pregnancies before so mother who have had previous uh, abortions or stillbirth or who, whose baby were born still birth you know uh, and or who were born to early preterm babies so those are risk factors uh, for such mothers to have another baby who may suffer perinatal asphyxia i will tell you why it's so important for you to know why i am talking about this risk factor please understand the difference between risk factors and causes we are not saying that for all these mothers i've mentioned they automatically will always have babies who have perinatal asphyxia we are just saying that if we're going to have any baby at all we're going to have perinatal asphyxia they are likely going to be babies born to such mothers with all this risk. Sometimes some mothers don't have any risk factors and they still have a baby born with perinatal asphyxia. We will explain that later. But I will tell you why it's so important for you to know these risk factors. Another risk factor is lack of perinatal care. So this is why we always talk about antenatal care, antenatal care during pregnancy. Some mothers feel, oh, I'm so... Uh, I mean, I've had two babies, three babies. I mean, what else is there? You know, sometimes each pregnancy could be different. And the essence of perinatal care or antenatal care is for us to uh, identify any of these risk factors, also identify any problem with you or with the baby that may lead to a problem during that baby's delivery or that may affect the baby's breathing during birth. So this is why we always encourage mothers to go for antenatal care. Also, mothers who take alcohol, you know, during pregnancy or mothers who smoke, it also increases the risk of having a baby who is going to uh, be at risk of perinatal asphyxia. Also, babies themselves, if there's any problem with that baby, you know, in the womb or the fetus, as we call it, and, you know, and the fetus is not growing properly, or the, baby, the fetus has some congenital or chromosomal abnormalities and all that, or other disease conditions themselves, you know, that they are going to be born with, such babies are also at risk of perinatal asphyxia also um the the positioning of the baby if the baby is too big you know or the baby the, so such baby so difficult labor or the way the baby present usually we want babies head down but some babies present they are lying fly across transverse line or it is rich their bottom is down their head is up or they are facing forward in on the instead of using the back you know so if we have all those abnormal presentation or abnormal lie of the baby it can lead to difficult labor and it, that difficult labor itself is a risk factor for a baby having uh, perinatal asphyxia. Also, babies that are born too early. So we want babies to be born from 37 weeks, uh, completed weeks of gestation of pregnancy. So if babies are born before 37 completed weeks, for whatever reasons, then such babies are likely to also suffer uh, perinatal asphyxia. Also, babies that have abnormal heart rate. This is why doctors always check in their heart rate. And this is sometimes we just use what we call the Doppler. We are, we are monitoring the heart rate of the baby and also in the uh, not so advanced tech areas, they use the fetoscope. They always listen to the baby's heart because the heart of the baby either dropping or falling it's a sign to us that that baby is going through some stress and it's a sign to us that that baby may come out not crying. So those again, risk factors for perinatal asphyxia. You can see that there are a whole lot of them and I'm not sure I can mention all of them, but it's important for us to know this risk factor because this is what your obstetricians are looking out for. This is what the pediatricians are looking out for. So if we already know that this baby is a high risk baby, as we call them, a baby who would likely need help, then it means that people that can provide such help should be present so if we, if we don't know this baby is at risk then it means people will not prepare so the essence of having knowing this risk is not to say the baby will automatically have perinatal asphyxia it's just telling us we need to be prepared you know like the boy scouts muscle we need to be prepared that this baby may need help and we are ready to help that baby to breathe in the first minutes of life other risk factors, babies that pass meconium or stool. So the first stool that a baby pass when they are born, we call it meconium. Usually they should pass that stool after they have been born. 
But if the baby has that stool in the womb before they are born, most of the time it's because babies are stressed. So when the doctors break or your water break, or the doctor break the water, they will see that there's stool already in the amniotic fluid or in the water. And that already tells us, oh, this is a baby that is at risk and uh, that will need help with uh, breathing. Uh, babies that are you know, bleeding, so mothers that have their placenta, uh, lying on lower instead of up uh those ones are likely also going to they may bleed and such are also risk factor for perinatal asphyxia infection infection in the mother infection uh in the mother can affect the baby and that will make the baby not to be able to breathe well and that again may be a risk factor for perinatal asphyxia so we've talked about risk factors in the mothers risk factors with the baby even the delivery process itself if the labor is too long so usually one of my lecturers will say the, the sun must not set twice on a woman in labor what does that mean in other words a woman should not be in labor for more than 24 hours so if the sun is setting twice on a woman that means that woman has been in labor for 24 hours and that is too long so too long labor difficult labor again risk facts of a baby who will be so tired or weak it's really that second stage of labor so we divide labors into three stages so the first stage is the contraction to the, when the mother is fully dilated so that can take hours but the second stage of labor when the mother is fully dilated to so the baby coming out we call that second stage of labor that stage must not be long because the baby is already ready to come out and each contraction on that baby is cutting off oxygen and blood supply to the baby so we want the baby to be out as soon as possible it should not be more than 30 minutes so if anything happens some mothers at that stage are so tired they cannot push they cannot do this sometimes we just even have to deliver the baby as quickly as possible because such babies if they if they if that second stage of labor is too long it can make that baby to come out not crying tired and have uh breast asphyxia all right so again uh i've talked about preterm labor post-term labor if the baby is born too early baby also born too late okay sometimes even the father we have to do uh some assistance to bring the baby out like using forceps or vacuum and all that that's also risk factors for such babies to have perinatal asphyxia so i've talked about these risk factors the reason why i really go into uh, i went into details talking about risk factors is that these are the factors that the pediatricians and the doctors obstetricians are looking out for to prepare ourselves so there are some babies that so the midwives can take that baby because we don't think there's any risk factor but even that the midwife is ready to be able to take delivery and the midwife is, is should be able to resuscitate a baby but because sometimes we still have some surprises even in babies that we thought everything is uh no issue at all sometimes we are surprised but a baby with a lot of risk factors then all all of our arsenal are put on the line for the baby so the pediatrician is at that baby the the obstetrician is at that baby's delivery everybody is there because we know that this baby has a lot of risk factors and this baby may need help and all of us are ready you know multiple deliveries for example we are always there and we sometimes we're also in multiples as well ready to take the delivery of such baby so the risk factors is not to scare anybody the risk factor is for the professionals managing that mother's pregnancy to know how to prepare for the delivery of such babies such babies with all these high risk factors must have a pediatrician present at the delivery a pediatrician and the pediatrician's job at the delivery is only for the baby we're not there for anything else but the baby only so but for babies who don't have risk factors they must still have at least one person during their delivery whether it's a nurse or the midwife who knows how to resuscitate babies so all pediatricians all obstetricians we are all anesthetists we are all trained on how to make a baby breathe within the first minute of life. That is what we call neonatal resuscitation. We are there, we are ready. All our things that we need for the resuscitation must be ready. Once we know that these risk factors are there. So this is the responsibility of the, the obstetricians and all the to make sure that we are aware and we are ready to help that baby 
to breathe. And this is important for you to know because if you know you are risk factors, please you must deliver in a hospital in a setting that they are able to help your baby to breathe. If you go to a, uh, a this is not the time to go deliver in a church. This is not the time to deliver in a mock. This is not the time to deliver in a TBA. This is the time to deliver by skilled professionals who knows how to help your baby breathe. Because some people go to deliver in all these other places where they don't know what to do and then they start rushing. Sometimes before they come, the baby is dead. Sometimes the baby is not dead, but the baby has suffered the brain injury. Of course, we will still take care of the baby, but the baby is going to have a lifelong disability. And this is what we want to uh, avoid. So my goal today is not to teach you um, better speak there or how to manage it, is to teach you how to recognize the risk factors as parents and to be prepared to know where and what to do so that you know that you are with the right professionals who can do the right thing but i just want to let us know a little bit more so what are the risk factors what are the i mean sorry what are the signs and symptoms of a baby who has perinatal species i think the commonest one is that most of such babies are born not crying okay not crying not breathing they are usually flat out they have what we call low muscle tone and um, sometimes they look white or they look blue um or dark depending on the skin color so such babies sometimes you know if we don't resuscitate them on time and then they end up suffering the brain injuries then they start having convulsions they are not able to suck they 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 could be in coma they are unconscious for days and all that some of them like i said they end up dying so these are the signs so but we don't really want to wait to see all these ones are present we don't want to wait to see this is having seizures not crying and all that we don't want to wait to that so immediately a baby is born we want to assess that baby and we want that baby breathing in the first minutes. That's what we call the golden minutes. We want the baby's breathing in the first minutes of life. That is the goal, the goal. And all, like I said, all pediatricians, all obstetricians, all midwives, nurses are trained in initial resuscitation because we must like to at the baby breath. Somebody was asking me the other day that why do we beat the baby? So I was trying to correct them that we are not beating babies. I know some people do that because they don't understand what is going on. So what we're doing is to resuscitate the baby. So we are helping the baby to breathe. Okay, so we start, there are things we do first, then we go higher and higher depending on how the baby responds. So once the baby is born, we are assessing that baby in 30 seconds and we're looking is baby moving? Is baby breathing, crying, uh, color? We're looking at that color activity and then breathing of the baby. So the baby's not doing any of those things. It's not crying, it's looking blue, it's not moving. We're carrying the babies quickly to resuscitate. And the first thing we normally do is to dry the baby. So sometimes that process of just drying the baby or rubbing them make some baby to start crying and they start breathing and that's all we need to do sometimes some baby we need to suction their mouth and their nose that process of suctioning and, and we are always doing this thing simultaneously we're suctioning we're rubbing and drying them we're putting them under the resuscitation uh, table or resuscitate and we have the light on and sometimes that is all we need to do for some babies and they start to breathe and everybody is happy some babies need more than that some babies need for us to breathe for them so usually we have this uh what we call the humble bags or bags that we used to bag and mask we put the mask on the baby and we breathe for the baby so that is if you're in a hospital we are all equipped if you're at home and you don't have all those things then sometimes we have to do the mouth to mouth breathing we need to get oxygen into the baby so we blow we blow into the baby or we use our max and, and sometimes just doing that some babies just pick up and they start to breathe and that is the end of it but some babies will not do that and they their heart is dropping and everything is happening so for such babies we now need to go further sometimes we need to give them drugs sometimes we need to uh intubate them we need to do more complex stuff so that is actually why you need to have all the spectrum of the expertise so some 
some people just know how to breathe for the baby and stimulate the baby and that's all they can do some people actually the pediatricians and assessors we have to do the, the, the intubation sometimes we have to give uh drugs to the heart side brain and all that we have to do the research and we aim to get all these things done within the first five minutes because once we are going on it for more than five minutes we know time gone brain gone we're losing the baby's brain so we're always trying our best to resuscitate the baby as quickly as possible luckily luckily most babies don't need resuscitation like i said most babies are born crying and you know spreading their hands and everybody happy but for the few babies that need our help we must be ready to help them and that is where you come in you must know that whether your pregnancy is high risk pregnancy and if you have high risk pregnancy you need to be asking your pediatrician i mean your obstetrician like who is eyes I, I, I maybe going to be delivered who is going to be there is the pediatrician going to be there and all that those conversation is important to have with your obstetricians so usually we we, we take care of the baby some babies they breathe well and they are fine and we just let them go with their mom for some babies we really have to work very hard to get them breathing and they are breathing and then we still see some signs even though they are not breathing uh the color is not yet so good the oxygen is not yet so good and uh they are breathing too fast or the heart is too fast or they are not yet fully awake and all that we have to take them with us to the newborn intensive care units where we'll keep them some of them we have to keep them on oxygen for a while and all that so it's our job to manage the baby that is not uh for you but usually we manage the babies and if like i said babies really suffered a lot of uh uh injury during that the process another one we didn't get the baby breathing quickly within five minutes and baby has suffered a uh, brain injury and then we need to monitor the baby for longer because we have to monitor them i see a lot of mothers asking me this question like oh uh, my baby did not cry maybe maybe cry after one minute so maybe cry after two minutes should i be worried is my baby going to have um uh, perinatus fix uh, is maybe going to have cerebral palsy, is maybe going to have a siege. You know, they are worried and all that. And I always tell parents, you don't need to worry. It is the job of your pediatrician to follow up the baby. So the fact that baby did not cry in one minute, some uh, does not mean baby is going to have the long term complication. It depends on how soon we're able to get the baby breathing. So I always said, if baby is breathing within one minute or by five minutes, everything is fine. It's very, very unlikely. And most of those babies are fine with you. They, they went home with you. We didn't keep them in the special care baby units and all that. So those kind of babies, they are always fine. And, and usually by the time you are, maybe it's three months, they already have neck control. By six months, they're already sitting. It is very unlikely they are going to have any long term issue so don't there's no need to panic the fire baby did not start to breathe first and we have to help the baby does not always mean the baby is going to have the long-term disability you don't need to panic about that the babies that will have the long-term disability are the babies that either they didn't get any help for a long time or it took us longer like more than five minutes to get them you know breathing and even after that when we do maybe like brain scans and all that we're seeing some other issues. Usually those babies tend to stay with us longer in the neonatal intensive care units before they they go home. And even some babies do still surprise us. You know, so it, 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 we can't always sometimes we are we can't always be hundred percent sure which baby is going to have uh long term complications. We have some idea, we always know based on our some of the way we manage the baby some of the signs the baby shows because we have what we call hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy and there are three stages of it as, as well so if your baby is having seizures and other it starts about stage two if your baby is not breathing maybe is unconscious like in coma that is almost like stage three so babies who are already going through those stage two or stage three are likely 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 going to have long-term complications but babies who didn't have any of those you know maybe you know they just have you know they were a little bit you know not very active and all that but no seizures no coma they eventually they recover most of the time most of them always escape and they don't have any same complications but the most important thing i think is for us to recognize the risk factors and to know when we have high risk pregnancy and really that means 
antenatal care antenatal care so i'm just going to round up by talking about how do we prevent birth asphyxia because birth asphyxia again is one of the killers of the newborn babies it's not just a killer it's also a cause of a long-term morbidity you know complications children having disability so how do we prevent this how do we ensure that our babies do not uh, have these complications during delivery the most important thing which i've already alluded to is anticipation we must always be alert to that baby who is going to have the complications of uh, perinatal asphyxia and sometimes we are not always 100 percent sure who it is i've already gave you a long list of risk factors what that means is that for any baby that has any of those risk factors minimum a pediatrician must be present at that delivery minimum okay so always ask if your pregnancy is high risk is a pediatrician going to be present at the delivery of my baby which means you must deliver in a hospital or a setting that has a pediatrician which is always a, in nigeria for example that is minimum of a secondary or a tertiary level hospital so it is important for us to know and this is what antenatal care is all about i always tell mothers antenatal care is not for us to go and dance and meet friends and you know all those things people do and listen to a talk no when you see your pediatrician or your obstetrician or your doctors for antenatal care even your midwife they are assessing you and looking for all these risk factors that's what they are doing they are looking for do you have high blood pressure that's why they check your blood pressure do you have diabetes that's why they check your urine for sugar for protein they are looking whether you have a heart problem they are doing your blood levels is your pcv high enough do you have a uh, hemoglobin ss or s or any of the mobilopathies they are checking all those things because they are trying to figure out whether your pregnancy is a high risk pregnancy or low risk pregnancy if it is a high risk pregnancy then your delivery has to be planned and pediatricians must be present because it means the possibility of your baby needing help of a professional to breathe is high and we have to be there so this is why it is so important for mothers please register for antenatal care and please don't say oh i have five years experience ten years experience it doesn't count here because what happened with your previous baby may not be the same every pregnancy is unique every pregnancy is different and the fact that you didn't have complication in the past does not mean you can have it you may not have it now in fact majority of the reason why mothers die during delivery or their babies die is because there was no proper care during pregnancy and during delivery labor is a very active process and even sometimes somebody goes into labor everything is fine you know no concerns and then things can change during labor and we have to now rush and uh, intervene and so that is why it's so important that you do antenatal care it's also important that your delivery is planned okay it's also important that your delivery takes place in a setting okay where the professionals are there so this is why we frown at all these hospital deliveries unless it's a uh, as a church delivery sorry or church or mocks or tba deliveries unless it's a church or mocks or tba that has a standard hospital that has standard professionals there so please we believe in prayers we believe in all those things but let the professionals do their job okay when it is time to deliver please go to a hospital go to a hospital unless your midwife has arranged with you to come home and they're going to take your delivery at home and they know how to get to the hospital on time unfortunately that kind of scenario is not really possible for now in nigeria with all our uh traffic issues and everything we don't even want to take chances so if you don't want to take any risk just go to the hospital have your baby in the hospital like i said ask your pediatrician your obstetrician you know ask them you know how you know just be sure they are trained in the natal resuscitation and they're able to help your baby to breathe if anything goes wrong. Well. most of them are trained but it is the job of uh professionals to do resuscitation so please if you are a high risk pregnant mom you must deliver in a hospital that also not just have a pediatrician but has neonatal intensive care 
okay because sometimes we need to take the baby to an intensive care unit and keep the baby there so for example if your baby has stool in the womb has meconium the baby is at risk of not just vas asphyxia but maybe it's at risk of what we call meconium aspiration syndrome we need to take that baby to the special care baby unit so there are all the things that we need to watch out for so if you are really really high risk your obstetrician would have told you and the pediatricians will be aware and you must deliver your baby in a hospital setting that have a uh, neonatal intensive care in addition to the uh, pediatrician again labor itself must be monitored so a lot of mothers they fall into labor they were like mm, i don't want to go and lie on the hospital bed i just want to uh, wait until final one hour or two hours before i go and this usually happens with experienced mothers because they are like oh, overconfidence now <laughs> but sometimes it can be dangerous so please don't do overconfidence okay once you're in labor your uh, contractions are becoming regular three in 10 minutes okay like this every three minutes you're having a contraction it is strong it is regular or you your water has broken you know please go to the hospital carry your bag and go don't wait until last minute because we need to monitor the baby and sometimes some babies things just don't go the way we plan nobody plan for some of these things but the advantage of being in hospital settings is that it's not, there's what we call emergency obstetric care so we are always ready for such emergencies we're always ready for what we didn't plan for so but if you are home sometimes it's difficult you know it's difficult and this is why some mothers uh so, oh, sorry sometimes lose their babies because they come in too late or things will change and by the time they come to the hospital sometimes it's too late so please go early in labor your labor must be monitored so this if you're in labor and nobody is checking you nobody is checking your baby you're in the wrong place so because some of those places they 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 won't even know when things have gone wrong because they're not monitoring so if you are in labor, you are supposed to be monitored. The baby is supposed to be monitored. Okay, so it's not just the con- it's not just the dilatation we are monitoring. It's not just the contraction we are monitoring. The heart rate of the baby we are monitoring that that baby is still fine because labor is a very stressful period for a baby, and it is a lot of stress on that baby. So we don't want that baby in that situation for long, and so we need to monitor and we need to be taking decision every few minutes three hours based on the uh divider so it's not also enough to monitor and just write down figures and statistics we need to take decision based on is there any sign that this baby is in distress is there anything going wrong what do we need to do now so decision has to be taken labor has to be monitored and decision has to be taken depending on how the baby is responding okay so it's so important that we do that and for mothers generally you remember we've talked about uh our role in preventing newborn deaths it's so important that we remember that role um pregnancy is something we need to plan for okay pregnancy is very risky <laughs> all right it's still very risky especially in africa you know and nigeria especially so we need to plan for pregnancy i know most people don't plan for pregnancy we just get pregnant and i didn't even plan for the pregnancy some of those risk factors i'm talking about they can be uh addressed even before you get pregnant for example your blood pressure can be sorted your if you have diabetes, it can be sorted. Uh, if you have other, especially if you're a mother that already has chronic illness, like uh, you have you have heart problem, or you have a renal kidney problem, or you have other problems, you know, it's better your doctor sort it out first, and then they can tell you, okay, it is now okay for you to go ahead and have a baby. So that gives, you know, it's 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 again improves the chances of that baby not having perinatal asphyxia so for example if you are if somebody with hemoglobin hexes again there are things your hematologist has to work together with your obstetrician about when to have a baby how to monitor you and all that so it's so important that we go for pre-baby care as well we take note of all those prenatal care make sure our health is at optimum if you are smoking you want to stop smoking if you are 
taking alcohol, you have to stop uh, because there's no level of alcohol that is safe in pregnancy. So some of those risk factors we mentioned earlier, there are things that we as mothers can do about them before we get pregnant and even during our pregnancy let's make sure we go for the antenatal care and when you go for antenatal care let's make sure that they are monitoring us and please one thing i would like to say before i close if the doctors monitoring us have told us this is a plan for the delivery of this baby uh we think the baby is too big we need to do a cesarean section please don't um reject it in jesus name okay and don't say you know in my family they don't give birth with knife we must deliver by ourselves i must be a hebrew woman okay there's absolutely nothing wrong with having your baby through cesarean section okay it's better to have it's a life baby and a healthy one than to to, to have a dead baby and a baby with a severe brain injury just because we want to be strong women we want to be uh, a woman who is able to bath by herself and please so those of you that like to shame women that have gone through the cesarean section please stop okay because it is also women that actually do that as well you know let's be women supporting women not women wounding women okay there's absolutely nothing wrong with having cesarean section and i know a lot of uh, a lot of people in Nigeria, if some of them have had two cesarean sections before, I've seen, I've had story of a woman who had maybe two or three cesarean sections, but because people, oh, unless you've had two or three cesarean, you're going to have cesarean section again. Nobody's even going to put you through normal delivery anymore. But she wants to prove that she is also a woman. I don't know how you prove that you're a woman by, <laughs> by, by not having a cesarean section that you're able to push a baby. Of course, she died. The baby died. You know, so these are dangerous things we need to stay away from. Okay, so if your obstetrician have evaluated your risk and they told you that you need to have a cesarean section, please have a cesarean section. Okay, this is completely better to have that cesarean section and be alive and your baby is alive than to to suffer any either the baby or the mother or both. Uh, losses and these things still happen okay so i think i just use the last few minutes of this program to advocate that I agree with the obstetrician and don't pray against uh having cesarean section there's absolutely nothing wrong with having cesarean section it's the most important thing is that what is the end what are we looking for when it comes to pregnancy what what is the end of the nine months we want to have a a, a healthy mother and a life and healthy baby some the mothers will always come to give testimony like oh i push my baby i push my baby i've been in labor for three days in fact uh, the doctor said we're going to have cesarean session and i said no i i'm, I'm a god does not allow me to grab my knife and blah 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 and at the end of the day I have my baby okay but some of those babies are going to have intellectual disabilities some of them are going to have cerebral palsy because even though you eventually had your baby it is not just having the baby that is alive but is the baby having no more uh, uh life you know like is that baby able to you, you know is the baby going to suffer some complications in future disability you know some of those things i know some babies have disability not because we can't do anything about it but some some are preventable so disability due to birth asphyxia most of them are preventable if only we follow our doctor's advice and deliver in the right place okay so please please always agree with your obstetrician and pediatricians when it comes to a delivery plan don't change it just agree with them all right so thank you so much for listening and uh, for those who are just joining i've been talking about birth asphyxia which is a common uh, complication during delivery and which a baby struggles to breathe or cry and as a result oxygen not getting to the vital organs including the brain and uh, leading to complications complications in future we've talked about the risk factors for better asphyxia there are risk factors that are present with the mother risk factor with the baby risk factor around the 
labor and delivery process itself and of course we've talked about the concept of the golden minute and all of us can learn how to help babies breathe there are lots of courses they do for people even as care professionals that are not really like doctors nurses level but that you know that can help babies to breathe in, within the first one minute of life it's so so important for babies to breathe it's so important for oxygen to get to the brain because when oxygen does not get to the baby's brain within the first five minutes the brain can start to die and we've talked about how do we prevent better speak so, which is my main emphasis this uh today is about making sure that we go for prenatal care antenatal care make sure that our pregnancy is well supervised uh, by skilled healthcare professionals especially when you have high risk pregnancies making sure that labor itself is well supervised and uh, for those who have uh, for every labor should be supervised but those who are high risk factors even much more should be supervised and that professionals who are skilled in unitary resuscitation are present during the delivery of your baby so that if your baby needs help we can deliver that help as soon as we can and hopefully the baby gets starts to breathe and does not need our help any longer and for those babies that need our help longer we can actually take them to the neonatal intensive care unit and provide um, uh, additional care for them so that is all we're going to talk about today on better speaks here if you have any questions related to this feel free to email me at drbemisola at askthepediatricians.com and if you have any questions remember that you, this program is brought to you by ask the pediatricians foundation we have a facebook group called ask the pediatricians on where you can post your questions from monday to saturday and our professionals uh, will be there to give you answer we also have facebook group for first time mom called fdm baby care we also have facebook group for adults called it's be family facebook group so you can check out all our facebook groups and you can ask your questions there you can also check out our website uh, www.askthepediatricians.com and you can always uh, read about some of these important topics that we talk about in this program. If you are uh, this is your first time of joining us, feel free to listen to past episodes. It's available on Facebook or uh, on our podcast, Ask Dr. Baby ATP, or our YouTube channel, ATP TV. And of course, if you want to have consultation with any of the ATP professionals, feel free to send us a WhatsApp message, and I'm sure we will be able to and uh, provide you with information on all together. For first time mom, we have a lot of resources for you. FCM companion, FCM 500 frequently asked questions, and also many other e-products. Feel free to reach out to us and we can show you how to get uh, those products as well. So thank you so much. Uh, for joining us today and I think I will be seeing you again in another few weeks and uh, finally remember that our Ask the Pediatricians um, Foundation and uh, National Medical Outreaches is going on right now and we we'll appreciate your support uh, in any way you can support our outreaches we try to reach out to indigent children in the most underserved communities in nigeria and in ghana so if you want to support that please uh see all the details on your screen and for those who are listening you can donate to our Ask the Pediatricians Foundation accounts, also 5815813 Guarantee Trust Bank. And if you are donating from outside Nigeria, you can go to our website and donate on the links there, or you can look for Ask the Pediatricians Foundation page 
on global giving and you can also donate there and if you're a corporate organization we welcome collaboration uh with you as well so that is all for today thank you so much uh for joining me and i'll come again next week uh with another episode where we're still going to talk about another important egg topic that has to do with the health of our children till then i want to say have a wonderful uh evening uh or day uh, depending on what time you're watching this and i'll see you again next week thank you so much for watching it's bye bye for me bye